heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. Ed Ludlow, he's off today. This is Bloomberg Technology. Nasdaq's $10.5 billion deal, we've got to talk about it. The financial software maker Adenza being bought. We'll bring you the details of the exchange operator's push into software. Plus, we'll break down the biggest takeaways from Xbox's summer showcase with none other than Phil Spencer, Microsoft Gaming CEO. And we'll speak with the former president of Tesla, who currently sits on the board of GM. He's going to discuss why the EV maker's charging stations are quickly becoming the industry standard. But first, let's check in on these markets. Actually, S&P 500 back in that bull market territory, 20% off of its previous lows, managed to hold into them ahead of the Federal Reserve this week. In fact, a jam-packed week. We're hearing from Mike McKee, CPI prints, retail data coming forward, and also the ECB, Bank of Japan, you name it, there's big macro data on deck. NASDAQ 100 pushing up, tech outperforming on the day. We're up nine-tenths of percent. As many feel that, look, we're going to get a pause, at least from the Federal Reserve, the central bank to the world. And that means interest rates just could be keeping on a steady path for at least the next month. Bitcoin off by more than a percentage point. Yet again, we're still seeing some woes of regulatory risk being priced in at the moment. We're off to 25,832 is where we trade. Let's move on to some of the micro moves in terms of the individual stocks to watch. Apple, I mean, when you've got a point higher on Apple when you're moving at up three tenths, three quarters of a percent. No wonder big tech manages to outperform. Still getting that sort of hazy, rosy glow post their announcement of their latest product. And at least Tesla also up more than a percentage point. We're going to dig into how this is a record run. 12 straight days of gains for Tesla as we think about how perhaps the slightly unsexy world of charging is becoming the fiesta resistance for this particular company. And we've got to talk about the downward trajectory of the company that is NASDAQ. So not the benchmark. Well, of course, it operates the benchmark. It's all about indices, but it's also about software. It's about technology data. It's off by 13% because a bit of M&A in the air this Monday. NASDAQ agreeing to buy financial software maker Adenza for $10.5 billion. Look, it's the exchange operator's biggest ever deal. We want to bring in none other than our M&A expert, now with Bloomberg Opinion, one Ed Hammond. And... Ed, this is a company that has already made M&A to build up the software offering to be able to provide more than just prices. Is it about reducing volatility? I, it is about reducing volatility. I think for NASDAQ, it's about reducing their dependence on you know, the markets. And obviously, right now, the markets are highly volatile and probably will continue to be volatile for some time. And this is something they have been, you know, as you say, through M&A and indeed organically, have been trying to build out for a while the sort of moving away from that pure dependence on markets. And this takes them in that direction. I think it's the biggest deal in their history. Uh, and obviously, that's the way they're trying to sell it to investors. But if you just look at the way the shares are trading today, investors do not seem so taken with the idea as uh, perhaps NASDAQ would like them to be. And yeah, and some of the numbers perhaps are a little underwhelming when you think about the size of the deal and the solutions business is therefore going to become 77% of total revenue from 71% today. So what what really is this $10.5 billion going to be buying them? Because it doesn't seem to be that accretive to their revenue immediately. Yeah, I don't think it is that accretive to their revenue immediately. I think this is part of a long-term plan and a plan to, as I say, rebalance the business away from the volatility that they've talked about. Um, and investors maybe, you know, look, they're looking at this and thinking this will be a good deal over time, but that may take a while to sort of come to fruition and to... to to sort of bear the rewards that uh, the NASDAQ obviously hopes it will. I think the other thing here is, look, it is just a very big number in terms of yeah. pure dollar value. That is a, it's a big deal. It's much more sizable than anything else NASDAQ have ever done. And also they are giving away, uh, as part of the consideration for the deal, they're giving away to Toma Bravo a significant amount of stock. Toma Bravo, I think, will become the second largest shareholder with a shade under 15% of the total, yeah. right behind uh, Borsa Dubai. And a board seat as well. And a board seat to Holden Spat, who is, you know, obviously a very, very senior and very successful person uh, within Toma Bravo. Yeah, I mean, talk to us about how this company, Adenza, was even built, really, by Toma Bravo. It's a classic Toma Bravo play, uh, something they do a lot of, something actually they're sort of the industry uh, leader in and something of a pioneer in, which is that they buy a technology asset, having already identified other technology assets that they could buy and put together with it to sort of create a bigger, better company. Um, 
you know, some people would perhaps pejoratively call that a roll-up strategy. I think of it as with them, it's it's slightly different because they're actually maybe just buying, you know, two or three of these businesses and trying to make a sort of, you know, a, a sum greater than the parts. They did that with, here with uh, two companies, Axiom, um, and a company called Calypso, which they bought a few years ago, and they've put them together under a single leadership within their firm, and then obviously a, a finding an exit like this. And they've done it before, either selling companies that they put together as, as a sort of single deal or taking them public through the IPO markets. Ed, so great to have you with us. Thank you very much indeed, Ed Hammond, on the latest big deal in the markets. We're going to turn our attention to a man who knows how to make an M&A deal or two himself and talk to CEOs about it, but also someone who's looking at how we're building the next big giants in technology, particularly when it comes to AI. Daniel Newman is with us. He's Futurum Group CEO right here in New York. And you yourself have done a fair bit of M&A. You've looked to like build own businesses. Are you expecting more M&A in this market more generally? It's interesting at a time where interest rates are rising and we know that Nasdaq's actually taking on debt to do this, that it's an interesting moment for companies to be trying to beef themselves up. I still think there's a lot of consideration about valuation. You know, we've seen the technology market come back. Mm. So those valuations have started to, to rise back up. But with this rapid onset of generative AI, companies have to move faster to move their businesses in the right direction, Caroline. If you think about it, we saw in less than seven months an onset of a new technology, and in the last four weeks, we've seen that go from something that you had to have specialized skill in-house to now being able to use something like Google's generative app builder to be able to take your entire business and, and build new apps. Companies have to move quick, and M&A does give that advantage of moving faster than building things in-house. Yeah, perhaps a little bit of respite from the whole thing being about generative AI in this particular deal. But talk to us about where you are seeing generative AI just suck all the oxygen from the room. And you have been putting out some thought leadership around, well, who's going to be the next NVIDIA? Who's going to be the next trillion dollar company to add to the club? Yeah, well, about two and a half years ago, Caroline, I actually called that NVIDIA would be the next trillion dollar company. And on AI would, or why? On AI, on AI. Now, part of it had to do with the potential of the ARM deal. But I mm. said either way, it was the only company that fully committed to it. Every other company was kind of dabbling in it. Mm. Jensen never wavered. And when the market sort of vacillated, even back to about a year and a, a year ago, last summer, when it was down to lows, around $100, people were saying, oh, it's done. You know, metaverse is done, AI is slow. And then all of a sudden you see it rise back and everyone's like, they're not surprised. But people just ride the trends. And the truth is, is that all this generative AI you hear about, whether it's open AI, whether it's BARD, whether it's hugging face and these large language models, Right now, they're being trained on NVIDIA. Now, are there other companies? Could, uh, could AMD, Intel, Broadcom, Marvell, these other semi-companies play a big part? I think there's going to be a second company, Caroline, that has to rise. Mm. But right now, NVIDIA's got the, got the route. And that's why it's accelerating so fast is because no one else can offer its, uh, the completeness of the NVIDIA stack. I mean, you mentioned valuations. And they're just eye-watering. NVIDIA currently trading versus future earnings at 51 times. I mean. It's interesting. We've been thinking about Oracle, whose earnings come out after the bell. They're being piled into because they've got a less extraordinary valuation, but still a focus on AI. Who are the other companies that you're starting to call that could be trillion dollar yeah. companies? Some of them, obviously, are uh, that, you know, I, I had Google and Microsoft in there. I actually put Oracle on my recent list of mm. companies, and that's because of the data. The enterprise data, the rich data that sits in the Oracle ecosystem is going to have to be utilized to give companies a competitive advantage. Right now, the open AI ecosystem has almost become table stakes. Yeah. Every company can tap into it. Every company can use it. You look at what Bloomberg's doing with its own GPT. You have all this rich data. And that's the competitive differentiator. So does Oracle. So does SAP. Another company I really like is ServiceNow. I've had a number of conversations with CEO Bill McDermott about it. I think he really gets kind of this, this, this aggregation that's going to take place of software. Nobody wants to tap into a CRM, an ERP, an HCM, all these different tools. They want to hit one aggregation layer. They want to prompt something and say, give me the 30-day forecast. Just ask it, just like we asked Google. But right now, we've got all these systems of record, and they're really, they're not that friendly to use. So this is where generative could really make a difference. To that point, I mean, every day we have another company coming on to talk to us about how they've introduced generative AI into their offerings. Will there ultimately still be the room for all of these enterprise software companies as they stand? Or are you saying actually you need an aggregator as such? Well, you know, I'm here in New York to go hear from Mark Benioff. He's going to do the Salesforce AI launch today. Yeah. Every company seems to have a story. And we're kind of listening right now. And what I'm finding is there's two things the market's listening for. One is, can you clearly uh, help the market understand how you're going to monetize AI content? Meaning, 
you yes. know, adding its table stakes. There's some companies that's always been there and people aren't seeing a lot of value because they were already pricing it in. There's other companies where it's obvious and apparent, and those companies have gotten a huge jolt. So as I see it, you know, the, the AI run is going to take place as companies can start to articulate what is the addition of AI bringing to the table for their customers, and are they able to charge any more for it? And all these software companies right now, it seems like it's table stakes. They have to put it in, but are customers willing to pay any more for it? And, and that hasn't been clear yet. Has the hype gone too far then? Well, I think the usability, the utility of this generative AI is pretty immense. And so the hype hasn't necessarily gone too far, but has the market gotten a little bit frothy on it? How long is it going to take to catch up? I mean, look, the reason NVIDIA has gone so far is because it's the, it's the shovels, the picks and axes, and it's also all the software to develop it. But at the, at the edge, at the software and on all these devices, the utilization of generative AI, it's pretty unclear how we're going to update our spreadsheets to show future values. Yes. So I think we've gotten a little bit ahead of ourselves, but there's no doubt that our world is going to change and the way we work and how productive we are, it's all going to be driven by these new AI technologies. Really well articulated. Thanks so much for being here. Go enjoy the event. Daniel Newman of Futurum Group. We thank him. Meanwhile, coming up, gaming news, thick and fast out of Microsoft. Xbox updates, new games. We'll talk about the platforms as well. So much to digest with Microsoft Gaming CEO Phil Spencer. He joins us next. And let's just take a quick look at Microsoft shares as we head to break, because of course, this is a company that's been fueled on artificial intelligence, hopes and dreams. It's pairing with OpenAI. How much are we starting to see a focus on its own M&A, of course, Activision Blizzard, will that become reality? How much of a gaming win can it be to take away some of the extraordinary appeal that its rivals have had it also within the console market? We're up three tenths of percent. This is Bloomberg. Going viral, you kind of missed it yesterday, Microsoft just wrapping up its annual summer showcase for Xbox, announcing, well, 13 new games from its own studios, not to mention the third parties, an update to its current Xbox Series S with some improved storage. I'm pleased to say, coming off of some of the adrenaline rush is Phil Spencer, Microsoft Gaming CEO, joining us to unpack yesterday's event in LA. And it, you talk about the platform, you talk about the additions from the gaming lineup in particular. And, and Phil, you call it your most ambitious games ever. Just how crucial is it that Starfield becomes a blockbuster for you? I think in general, our first party games library is important for us for many different reasons. Starfield's obviously a big show that we focused on. We gave it over 40 minutes with the Starfield Direct. But all of the games, I mean, one of the things I was very proud of the show yesterday was the diversity of games, games for everybody. We want to love a lot of people to love Starfield, but from the opening of Fable to games like Flight Simulator, Forza Motorsport, we want to have games for everybody, and the quality of those games is very important to Xbox. Let's talk about some of the prior lack of quality, if I can say it in a sort of slightly brutal manner to you, Phil, because there is this worry about Redfall in particular and what ultimately have been the lessons you learned from what many might see as a kind of flop when it was introduced a, few, a month or so ago. How are you going to differently support your own game studios on the back of that? Yeah, you know, we came off a really good run in 2021. The studio behind Redfall also did games like Deathloop, which was incredibly well received. We had Hi-Fi Rush earlier this year. But gaming is a creative endeavor, mm -hmm. and teams are going to try to do ambitious things, and we want to hit our goals with everything we try to do, and sometimes that won't happen. And you hit it exactly what we need to do. We need to learn, internalize what we could do better, improve our process, and I believe we've done that. And I think the reaction to the show yesterday shows that gamers have a really high anticipation for the games that are coming to Xbox. Is your process then more hands-on? You know, we, we definitely have tried to be hands-on all the way through the process. I'd say when we acquire a studio or build a new team, the thing we want to do is work really closely with them to allow them to be the best version of the team that they can be. We've been working on Starfield with the team at Bethesda Game Studios for really years now to make sure we're going to build the right game. And you know, helping teams realize their true vision is definitely part of what it means to be part of Xbox. Of course. The big elephant in the room is what you might still be buying, Phil. And with 27, what was it, other games coming on tap, as you say, more than 10 being produced internally by your own game studios already. Does this mean that you kind of don't need Activision Blizzard? 
And the thing that's always been unique to us when we've looked at Activision Blizzard King is the capability they have on mobile. And I, I know it gets lost sometimes, but the largest gaming platform in the world are people playing on their mobile phones. Activision Blizzard, through their acquisition of King, through the growth of Candy Crush, through the growth of Call of Duty Mobile, the work that they've done with Blizzard on mobile devices, that was the thing that really attracted us to Activision, was actually the work that they're doing on mobile. And I'm encouraged by that. If Xbox is going to achieve its goals of being a global gaming platform for the over 3 billion people who play video games, we need to be relevant on mobile and on console and on PC, and we think Activision is an important part of that. It is an uphill battle, though. It is really hard to change hearts and minds on the CMA. Do you think you can do that, particularly with the news we understand that Activision itself is going to be granted permission to intervene in the legal dispute? You know, I, I've been involved in this process now for over a year. It's been a learning experience for me. And I reflect on our process with the European Commission, where we spent a lot of time listening to concerns, coming up with solutions that met the needs of the regulators. And as you know, we received approval in the European Commission. If you include the countries of Europe, we have approval, I think, in 40 plus markets right now globally. You mentioned we're going to focus on the UK. We're going to focus on the US with that same approach. We want to listen to the concerns. We want to come up with active solutions that we believe we can implement and come to a good outcome for us. And we remain confident that we can do that. If, and I'm sure this is an awful thing to have to think about, but everyone's got to think about all the outcomes. If you don't get it, what is your future for mobile gaming? Will you build internally? Is it about other acquisitions? Uh, it could be about both. I mean, we're definitely burn it, building internally now. Uh, we, we have more Xbox users on mobile than we've ever had, but we're so small. And obviously, in mobile specifically, you have two big companies in Apple and Google that really control every game that somebody sees on their, those platforms and all of the monetization. So for us to achieve our goals globally, we are going to have to find a way to build more presence on mobile. Uh, we think ABK is a great way to increase competition in the gaming market, given that the largest gaming platform mobile is controlled by two other companies, so we think it's a benefit. But it is not the strategy unto itself. The strategy itself, finding new players, finding creators. We have more games being built on Xbox than we've ever had in our history right now. And that mix of millions of players finding all of these games that creators are building is the magic of what we have with Xbox, and we need to extend that to mobile. And it's the way you talk about you want diversity, not only diversity of people building the games, but the use, how you actually consume them. Cloud gaming, of course, a key feature in that in many ways, Phil. But it's interesting, the UK took issue with cloud gaming, worrying about your deal, sort of killing that nascent space. EU saying you would be a pro-competitive kickstart to cloud streaming market. How is the cloud streaming market going? Is it growing at the rate you see and want? Because what is it, only about 1% to 3% of the entire gaming market? Yeah, you're very right. Like, cloud is very small right now in the gaming in the gaming business, and even kind of on top of being small, it's usually kind of a secondary use case for somebody who's already playing on console, already playing on PC, and while they're maybe traveling here in Los Angeles, not saying I'm doing this, maybe I am, uh, that I'm, <laughs> I'm here, I didn't bring my console, and connecting to my console games via the cloud is a great way for me to keep playing. That means it's not really a separate market than what I'm doing on console or PC today. It's actually this secondary use case. That's a majority of what we see in the cloud and why we're really adamant that what we see as cloud is additive to how players play today. It does give us angles into other devices like smart TVs, tablets, and mobile, mobile phones, but it's people engaging with their Xbox games when they're away from their Xbox, and we, we think that's a good use case. Let's talk about your Xbox then to finish. Series S, of course, getting more storage. Series X, you've got more supply. How is the environment, the macro environment, for selling this right now? Because you're still very much in third position. Yeah, in the console space position, console, you're absolutely right. We're in third behind Sony and Nintendo. Um, but our strategy is really about players. Uh, and we have we love the players we find on console. Like, it is Xbox, after all, and people like to play on their console. And as you mentioned, we just brought out or bringing out this September the, the new Xbox Series S with more storage. But whether players are playing on our consoles, buying our consoles, playing on PC, where we're seeing tremendous growth, or playing over the cloud, we really stay focused on how how do we find new players? 
console is a great market for us. We will continue to invest in the hardware, but our, our success does not depend only on our own hardware sales. Um, and it's great to see so many players playing Xbox across so many different devices, finding their friends, having their game library, subscribing to Game Pass or buying games, however they decide to build their library. It's really about choice and finding new customers. Did you have any second to spare to actually game this weekend, Phil? Uh, I am playing a lot of Diablo 4 this weekend. <laughs> Phil Spencer. <laughs> Finding extra hours that the rest of the world doesn't have it. We, we thank you so much for spending time from Microsoft Gaming, the CEO there. Have a good rest of your Diablo playing. Meanwhile, coming up, we've got so much more to talk about. In fact, in the UK, let's go there because Google DeepMind is granting the UK early access to data and research. More on how this fits into the Prime Minister's push to make the UK an attractive hub for business and technology. Plus, we were just talking about it with Dan from Futurum. Oracle, actually ahead of its earnings, really trading near record, if not at intraday record highs. We're up another 6% on the day. We anticipate really, ultimately, AI adding to this business, adding and driving revenue. Wolf Research upgrading the stock to an outperform ahead of its numbers. $116 is currently where it anticipate, we currently see the shares trade. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Time now for Talking Tech. First up, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak taking steps to really drive home that Britain could be a key hub for AI research and regulation, announcing that AI labs, such as will Google's DeepMind, have agreed to give the UK priority access to its research. Sunak also outlined plans for an AI task force during a London Tech Week panel with DeepMind CEO Demis Hazarbis. Now, earlier today, Bloomberg spoke exclusively with Hazarbis, where he shared well, his thoughts about AI tools, how it could lead to scientific and medical breakthroughs. I think in the next decade, if you, uh, I think it could be very possible that it, we could build these kinds of AI tools to help the world's experts and, and medical researchers make some fast breakthroughs in all of these types of areas, as we've seen with AlphaFold, where we've now used it to fold all 200 million proteins uh, known to science. And uh, we did that in just over a year on, 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 on our computational system. So that kind of acceleration, and we like to call it science at digital speed, uh, I think is going to come to a lot more fields, including medicine. Meanwhile, Silicon Valley venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz is planning to open its first international office in the UK. The new London-based office, set to open later this year, will be established by the firm's crypto investment arm, A16Z Crypto. The move comes amid a stark industry crackdown, of course, by US regulators. And thousands of Reddit group moderators are pushing back against the platform's plan to charge third-party app developers for access to the site's data. Millions of users will be locked out of their favorite subreddits in the coming days as the pages go dark. So a Reddit spokesperson saying the company needs to be fairly paid to continue supporting high-usage third-party apps. Plenty more to come, particularly on the world of AI in medicine. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's check in on these markets because NASDAQ, the benchmark, still pushing up higher. We've got so much on deck in terms of the macro this week. Of course, got CPI print tomorrow here in the US. The Federal Reserve come Wednesday. We've got the ECB to be digesting the Bank of Japan. All of this actually managing to see some stability in the US two-year at the moment. So bond markets currently at 4.6%. Is it priced in for a pause in the Fed's move come June. But then what about July? Do we see yet another hike? We've seen 10 straight hikes thus far. Remember NASDAQ, the owner of this benchmark, NASDAQ company, is currently doing a big bit of M&A today, $10.5 billion. So want to watch as they get into more of the software and services side of the business. Bitcoin under pressure, just a little off by nine-tenths of percent. We're going to be drilling into that a little bit more with Stillmark VC a little bit later. But Bitcoin has been, of course, under duress from a regulatory perspective. Let's move it on and see what's happening in the world of individual movers. Because, well, interesting focus that we've been having Overall on Oracle, up 6% ahead of its numbers. People feeling really optimistic. AI, the driving force, but also remember this is a company that trades at 21 times earnings when NVIDIA chain trades at 51 times future earnings. So maybe it's a better entry point if you're betting on AI. Biogen, some hope there around, in particular, Alzheimer's drug being developed with a partner over in Japan, up 1.8% as some of the advisors to the FDA seem to be liking some of the work done there. 
and Tesla up a percentage point. Record run, 12 straight days it could well be closing at on the higher side. As yes, we price in AI optimism, but we also well, start to look at their EV charging stations. They're set to become the industry standard for GM adopting the company's supercharger network. I'm really pleased we've got an expert who can talk across all of this. John McNeil's here with us, CEO of DVX Ventures, as well as, well, a former president of Tesla, sits on the board of GM, also started countless companies yourself, I think it was six. Did you have anything to do with it? Were you, if you're a board member of GM and used to work with Tesla? You know, advising, advising Mary and the team behind the scenes, for sure. Uh, and, um, but this was really driven by Mary and Elon. Uh, and Mary recognizing that the biggest barrier to EV adoption is charging. Mm. And when I have friends that say, should I get an electric vehicle? Uh, they're often the first issue is, where do I get it charged? And their charges are reliable. Yes. Uh, and uh, the charging standard that has been in place outside of Tesla hasn't been that reliable. One out of four times you pull up to a charger and it doesn't work. Uh, and Mary and the GM team saw that and they said, this is a barrier to adoption. The Tesla uh, standard is better. It's more reliable. It doesn't break when you drop it. Uh, it's easy to handle. And therefore, to get more people in EVs, we ought to adopt the better standard. So it's a little bit like a Betamax VHS moment where <laughs> com uh, companies are choosing sides on yeah. which standard is going to prevail. And it seems to be, of course, Tesla's standard. You, you were there several years ago now. but. Was that ever part of the game plan, own the EV space, because it's a nice little money spinner? I mean, one analyst thinks thing is $3 billion a year, it could be. Yeah, it was originally just conceived to get people to get in EVs uh, mm -hmm. and to feel confident that if they were going to take a trip, that there would be a charger there for them. Now, I think you're right. This is a bit of an AWS moment for Tesla, yeah. where they're taking something that's been a cost burden for them and turning it into a revenue source. Ultimately, are there any issues with the way in which we see mass adoption using Tesla? I mean, we think about here in New York, everyone, the, the very governors, mayors, people trying to ensure that there's investment in EV charging and not always turning to Tesla for that. Will there be competition in the space or will we all just admit that it'll end up being a Tesla world that we live in? I think there'll be competition in the space because essentially what Tesla's done here is they've open sourced their technology to the industry. So GM is going to be building chargers mm -hmm. and its own chargers, but on the Tesla standard. Uh, and I think you're going to see more and more of the charging networks moving to this standard because it's just a better standard. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit more about where you're seeing opportunities within the EV space. As you're someone who's, correct me if I'm wrong, DVX, a venture company that you've built, in 2020, you first founded it, has a different model, not only in how you charge fees and the like, but it's ultimately about building companies within, you're like incubating ideas and bringing a CEO to match with that. That's exactly right. Are you trying to fix the world of EVs? Are we you trying are. To, yeah, yeah we are. are. We're active uh, because this ecosystem is going to grow so quickly. Like we're talking about chargers now and there are 40,000 fast chargers in the US. There are 4 million in China. It just gives you a sense of the growth that we're going to see here as we convert uh, from gas cars to electric cars. And we're playing in that space. So you're right. We, we're different in that our fund charges no fee, no carry. But we're also different in that we invent the companies from the start. And we own 100% of them uh, from the start. And so we've got a company called Kirby, which is uh, for uh, EV and gas cars, uh, where the cars are serviced in the customer's driveway. 80% of what you can fix in a customer's car, we figured out at Tesla, was, uh, was something you could do in a customer's driveway. So uh, Kirby shows up, it fixes the car magically. You don't have to go anywhere, sign anything, do anything. And it takes all this hassle out of the maintenance of these kinds of cars. What do you see about the last mile in general and the offering there? You were executive of Lyft for about a year when it went public. and. I'm thinking about the way in which I get to work, which is biking. Right. Well, this is a company that's under duress. We all know this. And we have sat down with a new CEO and he's talked about perhaps a sale not being off the table. How do you see us all, our future of transit if ultimately VC-backed companies kind of can't quite work out the business model once they're public? I think there are, like you said, in the last mile, there are opportunities for rides that are less than a mile. That's typically like a bike or a scooter. More than a mile, it may be an electric bike. And more than three or five miles, it's probably some sort of vehicle like a car. And so there are companies that have been successful in this space. Uh, Tier in Europe is one where it's got micromobility spread across the continent. Uh, same with Bolt. Uh, and here in the US, Lime. And so you've had successful micromobility models emerge that are VC backed uh, and are poised to return capital to investors. So I think we'll see more of a future of micromobility that's electric.
Do you think Lyft will be in, around as a name in that last mile? I think the, the, the industry is, is structured for two players at least. Uh, so I don't think we're going to see a structural monopoly with just one. And so I think here in the U.S. you're going to continue to see uh, Uber and Lyft uh, duke it out city by city. John, it's been great having some time with you. Thank you for giving us the areas that you're looking to build in and some of your experience in the companies you sit on boards of. John McNeil, of course, DVX Ventures, right here in New York, where he splits some of his time. Meanwhile, let's talk about another story that we're continuing to watch. South Korean prosecutors, in particular, are accusing a former Samsung executive of stealing trade secrets. The 65-year-old was arrested Monday for allegedly working with a Taiwanese-backed company to steal blueprints and designs in order to replicate an entire chips plant in China. The case could spark tensions, of course, between U.S. allies, Korea and Taiwan, two of the most important centers for chip making. Coming up, we could talk about, well, the world of fertility, Pinnacle Fertility, partnering with Tomorrow Life Sciences to adopt the world's first and only automated platform for the safe management and storage of frozen eggs and embryos. Talking about technology in healthcare right next. This is, is Bloomberg. Fertility. Okay, it's just announced that it has partnered with Tomorrow Life Sciences to adopt the world's first and only automated platform for the safe management and storage of patients' frozen eggs and embryos. I'm pleased to welcome to the show to talk about all this, Beth Sonorang, CEO of Pinnacle Fertility, as well as Tara Kamont, CEO of Tomorrow Life Sciences. And Beth, I want to start with you, because you bring to what is one of the largest fertility networks a business acumen here with your background in consulting. And I'm thinking of how in which you think, even amid the macro environment, that this is the time to invest in such technology. What you drew you there, Beth? Well, Caroline, it's really interesting. The fertility industry is in, you know, changing very rapidly right now. And you'll see more and more large employers actually beginning to give their employees access to fertility treatments that they've always needed but never been able to afford. So you see employers like Walmart and Starbucks and Amazon increasing this access. You, you also see this trend through education and social media for young women who aren't ready to have children now, but now understand that they might want to later. So you have this increasing demand for fertility preservation. And when you take these two things together, you realize that we have just like really unsurpassed numbers of patients coming into fertility clinics right now, and the industry has yet to change with technology. So it's so critical that we meet patients with the technology they need and improve our operations within our clinics. And our yeah. partnership with Tomorrow is just one step towards this technology revolution that's happening in healthcare. And Tara, you bring that tech. You've now reached, what, 50 clinics, at least about 20% of the market share overall. And it is this discussion, I mean, it's become less taboo, ultimately. We're discussing it more within friendships. Is there more money being brought into the system as well? Is this a tipping point? Absolutely. Tomorrow, as an innovation and a technology company, is fast becoming the new standard of care in the field. Um, as Beth alluded to, the field over its 45 years of existence has seen huge growth and has encountered incredible medical advance advancements over those years. But really, the tools and the technology to support these clinicians have not kept up. We're at a point today where there are millions of frozen eggs and embryos being managed and stored around the world and even in the US here. And yet those systems that manage these incredibly precious, valuable specimens are still, for the most part, manual, paper-based inefficient, rife with risk and error, and really in dire need and overdue for technology and innovation and streamlining. Um, whether it's clinicians or patients, or to your point with money coming into the field, financial investors, and there's been a huge amount of capital come into the field in the last few years, the future of fertility is certainly tech enabled, and we're, we're proud to play a, a leading role in that transition. And Beth, how easier sell or not was it to your partners, the physicians that you were aligned with, how much was an easier sell to your own financial backers that this is the wise investment and, and where else might be the next step? You know, it's actually quite a difficult sell. And I, I think Tara could also speak to this with tomorrow. But when you have a high science industry like fertility, where success for patients has, has you know, changed and innovated over the over the time, but changing an operation and 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 you know, accessing new technology is scary. 
It's not what healthcare is good at, and it takes a lot of time and attention and takes massive rollout. So this was not an easy step. I think Pinnacle Fertility is really innovating in technology and in this space. And clinics that opt into joining the Pinnacle Network know ahead of time that we're going to be very tech focused. We all join one medical records platform and we are all looking towards the next innovation in the field, especially within our operational model, to be able to to sort of service patients with sort of this next generation of technology that they're really looking for, whether it be texting, you know, a navigator, or, you know, someone who can coordinate their care 40 hours a week to better understand sort of what comes next in their journey to being able to see their embryos in storage in a safe environment in the same tech platform. So from, from sort of start to finish at Pinnacle, we are very much tech forward and looking at all of the different innovations and, and putting them into our network but each rollout and each change needs to be very thoughtful and it's actually quite a hard sell. So kudos to our physician-led network for choosing this as a team. And Tara, kudos to your, to your selling expertise, I'm sure, in some way. I'm, I'm interested in the next innovation for you. I mean, I hate to talk about AI, but I'll talk about AI because that's all anyone in the tech world wants to discuss at the moment. Where are you seeing Tomorrow Life Sciences lean into? Where is your industry currently thinking the next area of fertility management can come from, from a technology perspective? Well, look, I think, you know, we've started with um, what one could argue is almost the hardest part of the IVF lab today, the management of these millions of frozen eggs and embryos. And I'm um, completely aligned with Beth as she talks about patients and patient demanding increased um, care and better standards and transparency. I think as a demographic today, the patients that we see um, seeking fertility help, whether that be um, to build their families through IVF or the increasing, significant increasing numbers of young women turning to fertility preservation um, and freezing their eggs. These uh, people and patients are looking for safety. They're demanding safety. They're demanding transparency. They're demanding a better standard of care. And that's something that by employing something like the Tomorrow Platform, with its digitization of specimen management and then its automation of um, processes within the lab, we remove and reduce potential points of failure that existed within manual systems by 94%. So the whole world is becoming educated around how technology and innovation can really be enablers for the next 45 years of IVF and certainly automating further upstream within the lab elsewhere into what are still heavily, heavily manual, fairly inefficient, high work load processes is um, there's a there's a huge amount of work still to be done there that tomorrow's um, planning to lead the way in. And AI, you know, you mentioned it, it is obviously the hot topic. There's already AI beginning to find its way into the IVF lab when it comes to things like assessing and selecting embryos or sperm or eggs within the, um, within the IVF process. So I think all of that to say, we are just at the beginning of this journey. Yeah. We're at the beginning of this journey for this part of healthcare as a whole. We have a huge gap between the number of people in this world who need help building their families and the number of people that the fertility healthcare sector serves today. And we can only close that gap by embracing technology and innovation, whether it's automation, AI, machine learning, or so on. And we're excited to be partnering with clinics like Pinnacle and others to be, to be leading the way in that revolution and really increasing safety, transparency, and ultimately access to care for patients. Let's keep talking about it. Tara Kamant. Thank you very much indeed from Tomorrow Life Sciences, Beth Sonarek of Pinnacle Fertility. We really appreciate you both joining us on the news. Meanwhile, coming up, we've got a conversation with Stillmark founder, Elise Killeen. Why she'll be weighing in on everything, of course. The SEC, SEC's clamped down to how AI is intersecting, not just with fertility, but also the world of crypto. Let's just bring you some breaking news at the moment, because we are seeing at the moment Google to get hit, we understand, with an EU antitrust charge for its ad tech abuses. This is what we're understanding. The EU is going to be hitting those charges later this week. The EU's antitrust arm is targeting Google's biggest moneymaker, of course, and it's already faced more than 8 billion euros in fines. So keep a close eye on what's happening in terms of its parent company, Alphabet. Once again, big tech in the line of fire when it comes to all things regulatory risk, when it comes to the EU in particular, worrying about certain business models being held and controlled by so such significant companies. So Google, we understand, will get hit with an EU antitrust charge for its ad tech abuses as they are currently being deemed. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
It looks as though we have yet further breaking news coming to Google, which will be hit with a formal antitrust complaint from the European Union as soon as Wednesday and could ultimately lead to yet further fines. Remember, Alphabet, the owner of Google, has already had some 8 billion euros in EU penalties thus far. This, we under the so-called statement of objections could be coming midweek. It's going to be this escalation and really the focus on what is its advertising technology that Look, drives most of the U.S. firm's revenue overall. And the new charges will target the core, therefore, of its unit's ad tech business model, we understand. And it's the most I mean, significant and current five-year mandate that the EU's had in terms of looking at Alphabet. We're currently still up two-tenths of a percent, so no great shock to the market as it stands. We'll wait that breaking news come Wednesday. Now, let's just pivot away from the world of Alphabet to what else everyone's watching when it comes to regulators, and it's right here in the United States. Crypto, of course, they're paying close attention to really a number of lawsuits so far brought by the SEC against certain crypto related companies. Joining us now to share her thoughts on whether this helps hinders the sector in general, her own investment philosophy around it. Elise Colleen, Stillmark founder, managing partner, VC with about $85 million in assets under management. It's always so great to catch up with you, Elise, particularly as you're so straight talking when it comes to ultimately what this all means really for Bitcoin. It's interesting that the price perspective has been relatively resilient amid what have been some hefty focus coming from the SEC, whether it be Binance, whether it be Coinbase. How much does the impact and the focus on exchanges have on the underlying technology for you? It's great to see you, Caroline. So the actions taken against Coinbase and Binance are, of course, very different. In Coinbase's case, the SEC is purely focused on which of the cryptocurrencies Coinbase lists on an exchange should be defined under the current, current regulatory framework as unregistered securities. And here it's important to note that there's a distinction between Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And that was, in fact, referenced by the SEC in the guidance they provided before these actions and then again with the actions taken. And specifically what they're looking at is that there's no company or team in Bitcoin that can control the supply or affect the rate of issuance. And where that's not true in the cryptocurrency space, under the current regulatory framework, the crypto, crypto may be considered an unregistered security. And this is what the SEC's action against Coinbase explores. Ultimately, do you think it's beneficial for the sector in general that we get some sort of regulation? I mean, regulation is being dr driven in the UAE, in Hong Kong, in the UK in many ways, many feeling that there's a bit of a void here in the United States. But even if it is not actually in any way affecting what Bitcoin is or how and which it is processed, it can't be a great in, it can't serve adoption in general, particularly either by corporates or by consumers in terms of willingness to hold and trade. Yes, so of course it's positive. For Bitcoin, there's no effect because Bitcoin is decentralized and not covered under the SEC's um, actions. For cryptocurrencies, this is, could be an existential threat. The SEC has suggested that the current regulatory framework applies to crypto. And so what Coinbase will argue, will fight in court, is whether or not that's an appropriate framework to, um, to guide crypto regulatory, um, the regulatory regime going forward. Clarity around that will be positive for the ecosystem broadly. Now, at the same time, bills will be advanced to adjust a framework or to design a framework specifically for crypto. And so it's important to Coinbase is to see the cadence with which that advances and how that matches up against the pace we move through um, the courts with these yeah. SEC actions. How does it change the way in which you want to be investing right now, if at all? Is it, are you seeing yet more opportunities to be investing in companies at the moment around the Bitcoin ecosystem in particular? I know you back the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Right. So because we're focused on Bitcoin and because we've been um, conservative in our approach to how we understand Bitcoin interacts with current regulation, it actually doesn't affect Stillmark at all. So instead, we're focused really on what the best and brightest founders in the space are advancing. And much of that has been in the Lightning space, um, exactly as you say. So we are seeing increased adoption in the Lightning space, including from large enterprise. So, for example, recently Grupo yeah. Salinas out of Mexico announced a partnership with Ibex Mercado yes. to adopt Lightning for payments.
Elise, I always wish we had long ago. Thank you so much amid the breaking news. Elise Colleen, founding managing partner at Stillmark. Of course, my husband does indeed a senior manager at Coinbase. From New York, this is Bloomberg.